Okay, so I'm going to just kind of walk us through a series of questions. Um, anyone participating, feel free to add your own questions in the chat. Um, and we're going to talk about some strategies and tools you might use, you know, depending on the, the format and the modality you're using. Um, we won't necessarily demo any of the tools today, but we'll try to share, share um, suggestions for tools that we've used and strategies we've used. And we'll share some resources after the fact if you're interested in more information. Um, so I want to start with this um, choosing tools question and choosing platforms. And um, to the extent that you have a learning management system that is chosen by the institution, you may not have a lot of say in that. But I think where we do have some choice is in the the icing and the sprinkles that John suggested and what we add in to those platforms. Um, so do either of you want to talk a little bit about some considerations, things to be thinking about as you're choosing which tools to use? John, I'll jump start. in. <laughs> Thanks. Geez, I don't, I don't know which one to pick. This is like always hard. So we'll eventually get the, uh, everything on my list, I hope. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pick an easy one. Um, um, get a headset. Um, I've seen I've, I've seen videos of faculty talking um, either either in classrooms or in Zoom sessions like this, you know, and they're not wearing a headset. And and trust me, the the, the sound of your voice is and and the and the audio quality is a, is an absolutely vital factor to to learning. Uh, mostly, especially if students are spending many hours on Zoom, you know. So high quality means means that you, you should get a, a decent quality headset. I'm wearing, I'm, I've got a HyperX uh, gaming head, uh, headset. It costs $129. I know it sounds like a lot of money, but I was just doing um, you know, several conferences where I was on for eight hours and the gamers have this sussed. They know, the, they, they make the most comfortable headsets because you know, they spend you know, their whole lives on games. So get a good headset, both for your students and for your own comfort. I would, add, I would add to, to that. Um, so we, we, to support what John's saying, we actually help our faculty in choosing a good microphone in case they don't want to wear a headset because we have a lot of opportunities with, with very good microphones. I'm actually talking in one of our classrooms right now where we actually have digital sound processors where obviously it's not conducive if we're going down that path of hybrid, you know, some people in the building, some people remote, for a professor to be walking around with a headset on. So, but I'll, I'll agree. Sound is more important in this, in a Zoom conference or in a video conference than, than video is. Yeah, and so certainly there are a number of infrastructure and sort of basic technology, you know, uh, pieces that need to be in place to make this run smoothly. Um, I want to talk also a little bit about some instructional design sort of principles that I like to keep in mind as we're choosing tools to use. Um, and I like the the objectives of the course and the design of the course to drive the decision making. So I'm sometimes hesitant to advertise these tools that are available because the faculty might latch onto something that really doesn't support their learning goals in their class. So I like to make sure that's really driven by, um, by the, the learning objectives. Um, but there are some specific areas that I think are extra important in remote teaching and online education. Um, and those are like John hit on earlier, engagement. How do we make these live classes engaging for our students? Um, we know from research in online education and from surveys of our students in the, in the spring when we went remotely that it is a lot harder to sit and listen to an instructor lecture in an online format. It's a lot harder to know how to participate in an online format. So being really purposeful and thinking about building in opportunities for student engagement, building in opportunities for community building. Um, our students aren't in the building together. How do we make sure one L's develop a rapport with each other? Um, so thinking about, again, being purposeful about tools and strategies that help get students engaging with each other. Um, and then formative assessment. How do we give students more opportunities to check in and know that they're, they're understanding the material and opportunities for you as the instructor to know that your, your students are getting the material? And this is a great example of the extra challenges of being remote. You got my doorbell ringing and my dog barking. Um, but so I like to keep those, those pieces in mind as we're choosing tools. Some of the challenges of these formats are thinking about how do we make sure that this is equitable for everybody. Um, and I'm actually gonna step away my door. Someone's knocking at my door, but I'll let John take over. I'll take over. So, uh, you know, I want to reiterate something she said about, um, about your students. So students learn 
least best from listening and most best, geez, I hope that's grammatically correct, um, by writing and talking. In other words, by retrieving the information that they've learned, by processing that information and applying it to new uh, scenarios. Geez, this sounds a little bit like Socratic dialogue, doesn't it? Um, so you need to build opportunities for the students to write and talk both to you, but because there's only one of you and many of them, also to each other. Um, they, they, by listening to how other students have, um, have processed the same information that they heard, they, they do comparative analysis in their heads and say, oh, I missed that point. And, and, and by virtue also of them sharing, they're like, well, had you considered it this way? So uh, you, you should have tools, and, and I like simple tools like Google Docs. So have your students do simple essay, you know, write a paragraph, you know, spend five minutes writing what, what we just discussed or what I just, or, or what you got from the video that I prepared. Um, have your students record a small three minute presentation on a case or on an aspect of a case or on something like that. And then have everybody watch it and hopefully in an egoless environment, you know, comment on it or criticize it or critique it. Um, but the goal is to get students to do work that forces them to retrieve and process the information um, so that both they are learning it because that's how they learned it and you are seeing the evidence of that learning. That's a sort of a form of formative assessment. Yeah, I think that's right. And one challenge, and I'll talk a little bit about this more later as well is uh, thinking about how we provide opportunities for that formative assessment without adding, you know, a huge extra grading burden on the instructor. And there are a lot of ways that I think the technology can help support building in some of that automated feedback. Um, another consideration, I think, in this format that might be a little unfamiliar to people used to teaching in a traditional face-to-face -face class is this distinction between synchronous and asynchronous. And that diagram John showed earlier was perfect of some examples of asynchronous material, meaning Activities that students do on their own time before they come to your live class session, whether that's face-to-face -face or online, that help prepare them to better participate. And that could be videos they watch, that could be quizzes. Um, but by taking advantage of this format and delivering some of that material in an asynchronous format, um, I think it can actually help make a more productive live class sessions. Students feel more confident if they've done some formative assessments, they know they understand the underlying principles, they might feel more confident in class to participate um, in the activity. If you pre-record some of that lecture content, you have more time for discussion and community building during the live class sessions. So that's a distinction that I think is important to keep in mind. And we're going to kind of use that to frame the tools we suggest um, in, the, in this panel. Um, Mark, do you want to talk at all about some of the IT considerations in adopting new tools? Sure thing. Just as my video stopped here, we'll start again. Um, that's right. As John, as John has said uh, to us previously, too, basically you get the tools that your institution picks for, at least the platforms, right? We don't get to choose those um, so much. Uh, like here at the University of Utah, we use our, our Canvas platform. And uh, you know, we, we work to have some consistency. In our classrooms, as, as I've sort of indicated here, we have built-in computers uh, with a very uh, sort of strict set of, of uh, tools that uh, Obviously, we were originally focused on people teaching in the classroom, um, but um, we, we, we try to keep these all the same so that our support for them can be, can, you know, can be effective and efficient. Um, I think that's the area we're looking for there. Yeah, I mean, we're just, we, we, try to, we try to provide a solid, supported platform. If we're all over the place, then it's really hard for us to, to help everybody with all those unique and individual tools that they might be trying to employee. And I think that goes exactly back to the cupcake metaphor, right? Let's keep the underlying structure the same, make sure we can support it, students have a unified experience, and then to the extent we can, we have a, you know, a selection of sprinkles that they can put on top of their cupcake that we can also help support. Um, so, and having said all that, you're still, uh, there, there is no perfect, you know, even if everybody's on the same platform, even if everybody's doing the same thing in every single class, um, you're, the, there's always going to be uh, uh, tech support issues. Um, uh, there's always going to be local problems. There's always going to be, gee, I wonder how I do this that I've never done before, or never tried. Um, and, and, and you have to sort of adopt a, a, a posture of, of willingness to, to investigate and fix things for people. Um, it's unfortunate, but everybody has to be part of the tech support 
ecology um, when we're doing so much uh, distance education. Um, we've been holding these Friday uh, sessions of faculty tech support um, uh, every Friday in July. And, and the questions that come in are all over the map, you know, simple, how do I do this? How do I do that? To what's the best way for me to structure the environment um, for my students or what, or, or has anybody used this tool or that tool? Um, and, and it's perfectly all right to be curious and, and, and investigating new stuff um, with the expectation that you're gonna be the, the first line of tech support for your students. So maybe let's talk a little bit about that and what you know, given this transition and, you know, we talked about it's, um, it's not just technology support, although that's a big part of it. There's training. These might be new tools people are using. And then there's also this instructional design component that might be unfamiliar to law faculty as they're rethinking their whole course, not just the delivery modality. Um, John, do you want to talk a little bit about the support offerings that you're offering through Cali? Yeah. So it, when this whole pandemic hit, um, First of all, my thought was Cali, the National Strategic Stockpile of Legal Education. Um, because we've been doing distance or online learning or self-paced uh, tutorials for 38 years. Uh, 1982 is when we were incorporated. And I've been with Cali since 1994. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we immediately created, I mean, I created a, a website of, of tools that other people, of, of ideas and things that other people were sharing, as well as um, put out a poll. I saw people offering on Twitter to um, be a guest speaker. You know, I'd be happy to talk to you about e-discovery. I'd be able to talk to your class about, um, you know, uh, race and uh, technology or something like that. Um, and the problem is on Twitter, right? Those things go by real fast or somebody drops them on a discussion list and they go away. So I started to grab them and then I made a poll and I got over 90 people who were volunteering to be guest speakers for people's classes. Um, and that's something we're going to, we're going to extend into, into the fall. Um, later we said, you know, uh, the, this summer faculty are going to go through a redesign of their courses process. Uh, the best thing that we could do is to try to train them on some of the basic instructional design issues. And so we put up a, a mini course. It ended back in July, sorry, June 30th, but all the videos are there. It's at online teaching.classcaster.net. There's seven videos, there's transcripts, the, the presenters are law faculty as well as expert instructional design people for large universities, um, as well as some technoids uh, who, are, who are demonstrating some stuff. Um, uh, we, we also got transcripts of, of all of the uh, presentations and annotated them. So every time they threw off a Bloom's taxonomy or a Maslow's hierarchy, we put a link in there to the Wikipedia or to an article that it would explain it because you know, we know that they were gonna be covering material that law faculty maybe aren't uh, instantly familiar with. Um, so over 900 people signed up for that, 600 of them stuck through it to the end, which I thought was amazing. Um, but you, what we could tell they were, faculty are, are, are freaking out because this is a new thing. Um, you, you've never been pressured like you have this time to examine your instructional design and your modalities um, and, and you have to change if you're going to teach online because inside the classroom, your eyeballs give you so much information about how well your teaching is going and you don't have that in this modality. You don't have that in this screen. So you've got to find ways to, to do formative assessment and find out how your students are tracking and whether they're tracking and then whether you can do things to, um, to deal with problems. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, I've been impressed at Northwestern as well. We've um, provided a number of training opportunities for our faculty at the law school and the response and attendance has been really impressive. And I think that is because faculty are really thinking about um, this new format and what that means and what the student experience will be like and how that reflects on them as an instructor. Um, and certainly I'm sure you see this in the faculty that come to the Cali workshops we have a big range of, range of experience with these technologies from people who have already taught fully online courses to people who have never incorporated technology, you know, never opened their Canvas course before. Um, and so, you know, if you have a student attending a class from someone who's really experienced in this, you wanna make sure you're still providing an adequate experience. So I think faculty are really thinking about that. Um, and I, I appreciate you talking about the 
resources that Kelly has offered. And I know we have definitely encouraged our faculty to take advantage. Um, and there are a lot of really great resources that are already out there that don't need to be custom developed necessarily by your university. So I know we've been pushing people to the Cali workshops. Um, we've been offering a number of workshops as well around course design, around the tools. And then one piece that I just wanted to mention that I think has resonated really well with our faculty is actually having um, demos from faculty who have taught online before to share their practices, to share what's worked, what was more challenging, um, why they made certain course design decisions, um, and sometimes seeing how it plays out um, and hearing a faculty sort of real experience is a lot more powerful than you know, me listing best practices. So um, to the extent that you at your own institutions have people who are more experienced in this, I would encourage you to try to leverage those faculty members to, um, to share their experience with the rest of the faculty. Mark, do you wanna share a little bit about um, what you at Utah are doing to provide support for your faculty? Sure, sure thing. As I mentioned earlier, we do uh, offer, so, so again, leveraging the tools that, that uh, some new tools, I mean, we've had to learn some new tools as well too, right? We're, we're used to divide, uh, uh, providing such concierge level service, meaning we have a, in, I'm sitting in a classroom right now, we have a help button, right? So if you have something go wrong in that classroom, you just hit the help button, somebody comes running. Um, if we're not on site, because we're trying to protect our students, you can't hit that help button, we can't come and and assist. So we're, we're taking, we're, we're limiting the tools. I like, like what John said, limit, limit what's available so that we can, we can support you. I'm going to remember John's statement of if you add something extra, you become your own tech support because um, we, we wouldn't be there to help you with that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're providing training opportunities. People schedule meetings with us through our calendar, our new Calendly links, right? So that you can schedule a resource that's actually available. Uh, we meet, we train, um, one-on-one -on -one groups. Um, we are getting ready to, since our plan is also to do a hybrid approach, we're getting ready to plan to bring uh, faculty in for uh, you know, in-person sessions to show them how the technology works. And we're also developing core teams of, of individuals that will rotate on site so that we will be here to, uh, to assist with uh, the technology in the classroom. Um, our classroom technology is fairly automatic, but again, since we've had to add more to our classrooms, not so much anymore. It needs a, takes, a, takes a few steps to get started, if you will. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think that's a great point, too. There's, there are so many considerations about new types of support we need, but also educating faculty and students of where to go to get support. They can't walk down the hall necessarily anymore or press that help button. So put, instituting new, you know, processes around requesting support. I think that's a great point. Um, I want to now talk a little bit about some of these actual tools and strategies that we might recommend. And um, one caveat I want to give before we get into that is we'll talk about a number of different tools. I rarely recommend that any one faculty incorporate all of these things into their teaching. You know, you pick the one or two that work for you. Um, and I think that's a really helpful approach too for people who are feeling a little overwhelmed by this process and the options out there. Think about making one change to your course to help, you know, and, and you, that can grow as the semester goes on or, you know, if we're doing this again in the spring, maybe you add another, another change. Um, so it doesn't have to be a complete redesign. You don't have to adopt all of these tools, but um, we'll share a few things that, that have worked for us and our faculty. So I want to start with this synchronous format. So let's talk about remote synchronous. So when everyone's on a Zoom, or a Google Hangouts or whatever it is, a live uh, class remotely, um, what tools that you might use. Um, and I'll share a couple that, that have been helpful for me and things that we've actually, I think, demonstrated a little bit in this session. Um, and ultimately, these are around promoting student engagement, being more purposeful in the agenda for your class, building in specific opportunities to engage the students. That's more than just, are there any questions? It might be you asking them a question, you giving them a poll, do they understand this? Where are students at? I really like the polling as a way to be sort of a warm call. You're not cold calling on someone. Maybe you do a poll and you can say, oh, John, I saw that you voted this way. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, and it's a little bit softer than just cold calling on a student. Um, certainly Zoom and other web conferencing tools have built in polling features. Um, there are also third party tools. We use Poll Everywhere at Northwestern um, that has some sort of more robust polling features. And then there's even simpler features like raise your hand. That's a polling, you know, to get a sense of the class. 
put a thumbs up or, or a thumbs down. Um, so there's a range of different polling opportunities, but that's a really quick and easy way to gauge, you know, where students are at, make sure they're paying attention and, and participating. Um, I also really like the idea of using breakout rooms, which we'll do at the end of our session today. Get students talking to each other. Um, get everybody talking. You know, same as in a live class, usually you're going to hear from only a handful of students during that session. Breakout rooms are an opportunity for everybody to participate. Maybe students who don't feel comfortable participating in the large class discussion might feel more comfortable after kind of testing their ideas with their peers. Um, and I also think it's really helpful to think about a an artifact or a takeaway from those breakout sessions. Um, Google Docs is a great example of that. We're going to use Padlet later today, which I'll show you. And those are just web-based tools where while students are in a breakout room, they could be sharing their ideas onto this collaborative document so that when you come back together, you have a, you know, a, a clear view of where all the groups are at. You as the instructor can see while they're in the breakout rooms what they're doing and which groups might need some support. Um, so I think that's another really helpful um, strategy is just thinking about not just putting students in, in breakouts to discuss something, but asking them to do a task or have a, a takeaway that they put in writing. Um, John, Mark, either of you want to share some other suggestions? Sure, happy to jump in. So I am the executive director of Cali, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention Cali Lessons. Um, if you don't know what they are, they're online web-based tutorials written by other law faculty, peer-reviewed by law faculty. Um, and what, one of the complaints I get about them, though, is, is that people say, well, I didn't write them, so they're not, they're not relevant to my course because they're not what I would say to my students. And, and my comeback, which I hope is effective, is to say, well, if, then, then use them in that manner. In other words, have the students run the lessons and, and then you could run, you could then say, well, here's where I disagree with this law professor at this other school and why I disagree. And that becomes part of the discussion about learning because students are essentially learning to take opinions and ideas from lots of different places, collections of cases, collections of people who have written stuff, their part, their senior partners, whatever, and then to turn them into a persuasive argument or memo or letter to, for, for a client. Um, and, so, and so having them learn from multiple sources, not all which are in perfect alignment or agreement is not a bad thing. Uh, related to that, uh, if, you, if students run the lessons, you don't see the scores. But if you, if you use the Cali assignment system, which is like lesson link, then you give them a unique URL and then you can see their scores in aggregate. So, so you can see which questions everybody got wrong there's trouble, you could see uh, which students are getting all the questions wrong. That might be trouble. Um, and, and there's even a system called Lesson Live, where if you run the lesson in your classroom or in this, if I were to run it in this Zoom thing, and then you as the students ran the same lesson following a particular, following a unique link, then it's, it's sort of like a, a mind meld of poll, you know, polling software and Cali lessons, where each as the students answer each question, you see the poll of who answered which one. And you can display that to your students and say, all right, who got this wrong? I can see the name of that person. I'm gonna find out why you got it wrong or why you choose for this to be right. And again, if you don't, even if, if you have, if you wanna add nuance to the question, well, then that's the opportunity to do that. Cali lessons aren't intended to be the be all and end all of teaching, but they are intended to be rigorous enough that there's room for discussion on the, on the results. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that's a great example of sort of this flipped model as well, where you might have problems that you've written um, for, you know, exams in the past, you might have problems in your casebook, you might have problems, you know, through Cali assignments, and those don't have to be something the students do for homework. That can be something that they do together in class and work through and talk through as you guide them through the lesson. That's especially useful if you can give them the lecture ahead of time, asynchronously, so you have more class time for that kind of work. Um, and Thanks. as a faculty member, you, you do get the answers. Um, there is a way to go see the correct answers so that um, you don't have to feel uh, that you might be embarrassed by answering Kelly uh, questions wrong. Having said that, don't worry about it because the, the, some time, the, the questions are written by your colleagues and they're sneaky and they're going to, they're going to, you know, so the, the, one of the things we, I learned very early on joining Kelly many, many years ago, was that we needed a question type in which the most common answer was maybe, 
right? It's not true, it's not false, it depends, right? Um, and, 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 and that's because the law is, uh, you know, so, so interpretable. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. yeah, and I love your idea of the guest speakers that you brought up as well. And I think that's a good example of how, in some ways, this format has opened up opportunities that we didn't have in the past. You might not have been able to fly in that guest speaker, but they might be willing to hop on a Zoom call for half an hour. And that can happen live in a Q&A session with your class. That could be pre-recorded and a thing that you can reuse, you know, for future years. So that's another good example. And also gets at that piece of providing different perspectives and showing that there might be different approaches to, to any given problem. Nothing better than bringing in a practicing attorney and say, so what's your, so how do you, how do you deal with uh with this situation, um, you know, and, and if you're, and if you're, and if there's current events going on uh, that are, that are relevant to your course in constitutional law or immigration or environmental or whatever, finding people who will give you 15 minutes, uh, you know, an honest 15 minutes on that is, is just gold for the students because, because otherwise they have no, they have no concept of what they're going to be doing when they graduate. And so glimpses into that are valuable. Absolutely. Um, so we talked about, you know, using breakout rooms and problems in your live class sessions. We talked about polling, different opportunities to really encourage engagement. Um, another question that we get asked a lot is about taking attendance in a, a live Zoom class. Um, I think John will share with us a resource that might make this easier for faculty. Oh, geez. Uh, how do I share it? I guess I'll, 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 I'll just defer to April Dawson, who's an awesome uh, law professor at um, NCCU. Um, and she's, she even did a video. Uh, she, she, she taught one of the, the mini courses. Um, if uh, one of you will grab that URL and drop it in the chat. Um, I got it. This is, she, she uses Airtable, which is an online it's a, it's a web-based sort of database thing. And she explains, it's a little nerdy, but it's not that hard. Uh, you know, mere mortals can, can pull this off um, for, for taking attendance effectively. Um, and uh, uh, ra rather, I, we don't have enough time to do uh, uh, short demos or things like that, but, but you should take a look at that. Because a lot of people have said they've used it and found it to be really valuable. I wanted to uh, go a little further and say, one, one of the hardest things in, in this whole space is discussion boards. Um, and first of all, I'll just agree, quality discussion or forums is, is, is work or is, is often a frustrating or difficult thing, right? The students don't show up. The gunners show up first, answer the question so thoroughly that everybody else can just go, yeah, what he said. Um, there's an article that I read that explains a little bit more about that. It's, that, uh, it's the, where they, I got that same graphic. Um, and I'll, I'll grab that and drop that in the chat as well. And I thought he, he provides one of the one of the best sort of short explanations, you know, as to why a well-designed forum can, you know does a lot. It allows the students to compare responses, to voice concerns, to see what other students are doing. There's an awful lot of turning to your, you know, seeing what your colleagues are doing, and mirroring or mimicking activity that is part of the basic part of all learning. Um, and so although discussion forums are hard, they're valuable. You know, they're, 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 they're gold that you have to mine and refine a little bit. Thanks, I think that's exactly right. And um, you know, now we're starting getting into these asynchronous tools that might supplement the material and also again, help make a better live class session by having students think through these things ahead of time. But um, I find it often comes down to the question, writing a really good question and telling students what you expect. Um, Maybe it's not that, you know, you post three questions, maybe you don't expect every student to write, you know, a full essay response to all three questions, but rather choose one and then respond to some other people or build off what their peers are saying. So I think being really explicit about what you're looking for from students in those discussions can help. Um, I also think it reaches a different group of students. Again, some of those students who might not be as comfortable speaking up during your live class session, you might find have a lot to say in the discussion board. And um, even by extending an in-class discussion, either before or after a live class on the discussion board, you might get different people participating in the, in the conversation. Um, I wanna talk about a couple other asynchronous tools that I found really helpful. Um, and one of those being pre-recorded lectures. Again, opening up time in your live class session to make it more interactive, make it more engaging, answer student questions, 
maybe you pre-record some of the lecture content, the stuff that's really passive on the part of the student. Um, in my experience, students really like that. They like going back and re-watching it. Um, and they don't have to be fancy. As uh, Mark and John alluded to earlier, great audio is probably the most important thing. Having you know, clear and simple slides if you're using them. But otherwise, it can be conversational. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, but just by sort of chunking your material and creating these videos that students can watch ahead of time, it might also give them more time to process the content before they come to class and are asked to apply it um, in a discussion. Um, so I really like pre-recorded videos. Um, we use both Zoom, just have, student, have faculty open up their Zoom and record a, a session there. Um, and we also use Panopto is the video service we have um, at Northwestern for faculty to record and manage their videos. Um, I also and often for, recommend, for, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and for video that you record, uh, if you have uh, um, um, ADA issues, if you, you, if you record Zoom to the cloud, it will automatically create a uh, captioned, um, what is it, a transcript for you, um, which you can then download. Obviously, if you record locally, it doesn't do that. Um, and we, we use that in the mini course, and it's actually pretty good. It's like 98% decent, which is which uh, I wouldn't have said that a few years ago. Um, um, and, and the second thing about that is I found that having the transcript, especially if something is dense, if you're talking about a relatively dense topic area, re-watching the video while reading the transcript is, 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 is a very powerful learning technique. Um, and unfortunately, hard to convince people to do. It's like, yeah, I watched it once. You know, students are like, I, already, I have so much, I can't watch things twice. You know, the, but, but I got to say, it's, the, it's one of the best ways to really learn something is to watch it a second time, even if you do knock it up to 1.2 or 1.5 speed or, um, in, your, in the player. Yeah, that's a great point. And I have found, I mean, I, I hear from students all the time that they love the transcripts, the captions, they always use them, um, which surprised me a little bit, to be frank. But um, I think those are very popular with students. And um, I have also found in using our Panopto service, I can track views of videos and a lot of students go back and rewatch videos um, and that also can give the instructor some information like hey this one section the students keep going back to maybe i need to provide some more clarification on this area so i think that is another area where you just can get more information in the online space than you might be able to get in a face-to-face -face classroom um, and i often hear from faculty that they have a better sense of how their class is doing online because they're getting data from all of the students and not just the six that speak up in class. Um, so that's another kind of benefit built in. Let me, let me toss in that if you could create an MP3 of your classes, even if it's a video, the MP3 is uh, smaller and much more transportable and listenable, listenable on you know, treadmills and while walking the dog. And, in other words, a podcast. Um, uh, going back to the point we made at the very opening, uh, quality audio beats or trumps uh, quality, you know, the, the quality of the video, or is more important than. Um, it's extra work. I know, I know, I know. So, uh, so call Mark and say, Mark, would you do this for me? Sure, call me. <laughs> um, I want to mention two other tools that just have gained a lot of traction for us um, at Northwestern. One is this idea of video discussions. So sometimes on a discussion board, it makes sense to have students write in text. Sometimes it's nice to have them record a little video for things that are more personal. It can help build community, get to know each other, put a face to the name. Um, maybe you want them to practice a presentation, you know, giving it orally. Um, we have been using a tool called Flipgrid. That's free. It's owned by Microsoft. Um, really easy for students to go in. You can give them a time limit and record a response to a video. Again, I find that particularly helpful for um, activities where you want them to share a personal experience or their personal opinion. Um, and it's just a little more personal than maybe a written discussion. And it comes across more informal. So maybe you don't, you want students to have a more informal conversation around something. That's one way to encourage it. Um, another tool that I will mention that um, we have a number of faculty using is Perusal. And there are a number of other tools that do something similar, um, but it's essentially collaborative annotation. So you can upload your readings or work with your publisher to get your readings integrated into the platform. And kind of like the way you would write on the side of your book, you can do that on this digital platform, but students can do that collaboratively. Instructors can pose questions, students can pose questions um, sort of in line with the reading. And so it makes the, the work that students were really doing independently before sort of a, a collaborative experience and they can see where their peers had questions, answer each other. And it also gives the instructor a sense of, you know, 
where students might be having trouble. So that's just another tool I wanted to mention. Um, are there any other tools, strategies that either of you want to mention? We're, we're, we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll rather say go to onlineteaching.classcaster.net and look. You don't have to watch all the videos, but we've extracted all the tools that were talked about, and there were dozens of them, um, and put them in, 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 in on the page for each of the uh, mini course sessions, um, including a little blurb about what, what it's about. Um, so, so go there. You'll find lots more examples um, that I can do right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, and before we go into breakouts, I want to give Mark a chance to talk a little bit about um, one format that we didn't touch on yet, which is this kind of hybrid where people are teaching face to face and potentially also accommodating remote learners. Um, right. And do you want to talk about how you're approaching that? Right. Sure. Sure. Real quick. Um, like I said, we'd always hoped that we'd get to a place like this. We just didn't think we'd have to do it overnight. So everything is, is uh, you know, um, super fast mode getting these things, but we, we obviously we plan on being hybrid, uh, like a lot of people answered the, the uh, survey. Um, so we have been integrating uh, front of room cameras just to give sort of a, a more teaching in the round sort of perspective. So I'll just jump to my, the other camera that's in this room. This, this camera I've got, I've actually added to this room. And the actual um, view of my room, you get a picture on the back of my head, but the idea would be, you know, the remote students would be able to uh, get a perspective of what's happening in the classroom. And as an instructor, back behind me would be my remote students. And I could actually turn around and face them and engage with them in that regard. Obviously, my back's to my class, but the whole idea is how are we going to be more engaging um, as, we, as we do these sort of hybrid teaching. Um, like I said, again, we had to, we had to fire this up. Uh, rather quickly compared to uh, what we would have maybe wanted to do. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's, sort of, that's sort of from a physical perspective what we've been doing uh, to try to create more engagement um, with the remote, the remote people engaging with the in-class in people and the instructor sort of being able to address someone who, who might be remote, who might ordinarily just be looking at a camera from the back of the room looking at the back of their, their, their cohorts' heads, or even if there was a, a camera like I'm using right here, that's all the remote people would ever see is just the instructor talking. So. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that is one of the most challenging sort of situations for an instructor to manage and goes back to that idea of being really purposeful and specific about your sort of agenda for the class. Um, I want to make sure we have time for you all to talk. It's been enough of listening to us. So I'm going to share my screen briefly as we get ready to put you in breakout rooms. Um, I'm going to share a link in the chat to this Padlet. Um, and this is one of the tools I mentioned earlier so that we can get kind of some takeaways from your conversations in the breakout. So I added a link there in the chat as well. Um, but what you'll do in your groups is try to answer these questions and think about what tools you're using, how you're approaching teaching differently, um, and, and maybe even talk about the decisions your institution is making as you're going remote. So um, in this Padlet, any, you can choose a moderator from your group. We recommend find the person's birthday is closest to today. Um, and you just click this little plus button under each of these categories, and you can add the thoughts and notes from your group. And then this link will persist. We'll have a, a aggregate of all of our tools and suggestions here in one place. Um, so in just a moment, um, Mark is going to put us into breakout rooms. And again, this link is in the chat. So if you haven't clicked it, go ahead and open up that Padlet so you can participate while you're in there. Um, and we'll come back in like nine, 10 minutes right towards the end of the session. Okay, here we go. Awesome, welcome back everybody. I know that was not nearly enough time, but one thing I will say is that our went by so fast. We will leave, uh, obviously, this Padlet up, continue to add stuff to it. Um, we can go in and add some links to the tools we referenced today as well, so that Padlet can serve as sort of a repository from um, all the takeaways from this discussion today. Um, Mark, John, any final thoughts, closing words? I appreciate everybody giving us some time to, to talk to you today. Things, different things that we're all struggling with. We're holding uh, Cali and Technoids. Technoids, by the way, if you don't know the term, are law school tech people. Um, are, are holding uh, open houses every Friday in July from 2 to 4 Central Daylight Time. Um, just go to the online teaching.classcaster.net. Uh, the Zoom link is always there. There's a Google Doc for each one of those. So as we talk about and show stuff, we then throw the information into there. If you look at the past two Google Docs, there's some 
uh, sprinkles and icing for you to, uh, for you to peruse. Um, notice one of the other instructional design techniques, by the way, is repetition. <laughs> so if I continue to repeat sprinkles and icing, it ties you back to the idea of, uh, of the tools and techniques that you, you use to add to your classes. And makes you hungry. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and with that, it's, it's time for lunch, so. That's right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.